A happy, happy day to you and welcome from Schweizer Church. We're so glad you've tuned in to worship along with us today. If this is your first time, we'd invite you to take a moment and let us know you're here. We'd love to send you a gift card for a coffee. Today we're going to continue our sermon series called Come Follow Me. And today we're going to be looking specifically at this thought that we're called to be people who serve in our communities and the places where we live. We're going to hear Jesus talk about that from Matthew 25 and a number of other stories from the life of Jesus that are going to be impactful to us. If you'd like to grow deeper with this sermon, you can find sermon discussion questions at switzer.church slash next. A lot of other ways you can continue to grow in your faith there as well. Stephanie's going to come and she's going to share with us some things that are happening this week, some ways you and I can be plugged in at Schweitzer. So let's lean in. Hi, welcome to Schweitzer. I'm Stephanie and happy Mother's Day. Today we are celebrating all of the special ladies in our lives and next month on Father's Day we'll be celebrating all of the guys and we're inviting you on Father's Day weekend, that's June 18th, to get out of the city and enjoy a great camping and canoeing adventure in Eminence, Missouri. Grab your family or your friends or both and you can stay in the lodge or a tent or in a camper, anything that you like. We'll be enjoying time around the campfire, canoeing on Saturday, and worship outdoors on Sunday. If you know you're going to attend, go ahead and sign up today, but no later than Memorial Day. You can find out all of the details about this and other outdoor adventures at schweitzer.church outdoors. We have a beautiful space for prayer and gathering near our prayer chapel. And this summer we'll be adding more special pavers to this area. If you'd like to have a paver engraved in memory or in honor of someone, we'd love to have you submit that name to schweitzer.church slash pavers and we'll get more details to you. We know there's a lot happening here at Schweitzer. And if you're new, you might have questions about all of those things that are going on and how you can get connected. If that sounds like you, we invite you to join us for our Next Steps Lunch happening next Sunday at 1145, right after our modern service. You can sign up today at the Blue Booth or by going to schweitzer.church slash next. Staying up to date on all of the things going on around Schweitzer can be challenging, but there are a couple of really easy ways that you can connect and keep up to date on all of these things. First is by going to our website at schweitzer.church next, or by downloading the Church Center app. Here you can keep up to date on all the activities and even sign up for them. If you have more questions about these things or want to find out how to download that app, feel free to stop by the Blue Booth in the Fellowship area today, and we would love to talk with you more. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Let's continue with worship. Thanks, Stephanie. Now, if you're worshiping with us live, we invite you to take a moment and let us know that you're here. You can put your name in the chat room. You can wave to your friends, say hello to folks. Uh, if you like prayer, you can go into the prayer room and somebody would be happy to pray with you. And now as we begin to enter into worship, let us hear this call from the psalmist. Come, let us shout to the rock of our salvation. Come, let us worship the Lord with shouts of gladness. Let's enter into worship together. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all? Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? 
Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal? Is he worthy, is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He Today we're going to be hearing about service as we listen to Pastor Spencer. As we get ready for prayer, I'd like to share a little bit of a, of a piece of writing, actually part of a letter, um, and, and then a prayer that comes out of the book, um, a common prayer, a liturgy for ordinary radicals. Um, this, <clears throat> this part of the letter is, is written to Harriet Tubman by fellow abolitionist Frederick D Douglass. And Douglass wrote this, most that I have done and suffered in the service of our cause has been in public, and I've received much encouragement at every step of the way. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. Most that you have done has been witnessed or, uh, by a few trembling, scared, and foot-sore bondsmen and women whom you have led out of the house of bondage and whose heartfelt God bless you has been your only reward. It's profound how Douglas says, out of an act of service, 
the best thing that Harriet Tubman ever received, the biggest prize was a God bless you because she served in a way that was out of sight for most folks. As we think about the impact of mothers and Mother's Day and all that mothers do in this world, much of what they've done has been out of the sight of others, but their service is so great and so grand and so significant to us all. So today I invite you to pray with me for those around us who serve in powerful yet unseen ways. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that throughout history, there have been women whose steadfast faith and hope in you have brought about justice, freedom, and security for those who most need it. We pray that we can learn from women like Rahab and Esther and Harriet Tubman what it means to commit our lives to your service each and every day. We take a moment to give you thanks, Lord, for our own moms, our own mothers, and those who've been like mothers to us. now would you pray the prayer that Jesus taught us? Say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So as we think about inspirational women in our lives today, one of those people that we're going to celebrate is Cheryl Mull. She's been our traditional worship leader at Schweitzer for the last 12 years. And for almost 40 years, she's been a part of Schweitzer music and ministry in some form or fashion. And she has a word that she's going to share with us today. So I invite you uh, to lean in to what Cheryl has to say and to hear this good word. Hi, I'm Cheryl Mall, and it's hard to believe that this is my last Sunday on staff here at Schweitzer. I've been here a long time. <laughs> I came 12 years ago as the full-time director of music and traditional worship, but I actually started in the music ministry at Schweitzer in 1984. I came to play the organ and the piano for the uh, services and for the choir, and it's been a wonderful journey all the way through here. So I've been asked, why I stuck around here for almost 39 years. The answer is pretty easy for me. It's love, I love doing music. I love the people I get to work with. They're not only talented, they're caring, and they're generous, and they're fun. And it's just wonderful to be able to express our love for each other and for God through the vehicle of music. This church has been very important to me over the last 39 years. I came here in my late 20s, had two small children, and had one baby after I got here. And the people in this church have become friends and life partners with me, watching me grow up, watching my kids grow up, and making connections. I love not only the worship service, but also the Sunday school classes and my chances to serve as reading buddy and as a second season and other opportunities that I have had. Even though I'm retiring from full-time ministry, I'm still going to continue on with the Joy Pickers and the Senior Saint Choir. Those are two wonderful groups and we go out into the community, primarily retirement homes, and present music to the people. It's very much appreciated and honestly we get as much from them as they do. I want to say thank you to all the people I've been able to work with over the years. The choir, the musicians, the staff, my friends. It's truly an honor to be able to praise God through music and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, it, is a, it is with great joy that we celebrate Cheryl's retirement. And there are not enough superlatives to, um, to speak, to describe Cheryl's significance or influence here at Schweitzer. We're so thankful that she's gonna be a part of who we are going forward, that she's gonna be around, engaged, involved, 
uh, and yet leaning into that retirement life. It's, it's a fascinating, fantastic place for her to be. So thank you so much for your, your ministry in and among us. And thank you so much for your generosity, your faithful giving, your act of giving as a, as a part of worship, which helps make things like traditional worship thrive and flourish at Schweitzer. So thank you for that. You can give on, online today at schweitzer.church slash give or in the Church Center app. Uh, thank you so much. And now we're going to turn our attention to the book of Matthew. So I hope you have your, uh, your Bibles with you. Week five, come follow me. Let's go. Well, friends, welcome today. My name is Spencer. I'm so glad that you're here with us. Today is part five of our series, Come, Follow Me. This is, of course, something that Jesus says whenever he invites people to come and be his disciple, to learn from him and to learn this new way of life as a disciple. And so what we're doing in this series is we're spending six weeks exploring this call of Jesus, not in a general sense, but very specifically, we're asking, what does this mean to be a disciple here in this church, this fellowship, this body that we call Schweitzer? How do we live this out? And so we're lifting up six values or or practices that we just think are absolutely crucial to being a disciple of Jesus, to learning this new way of life that he offers us. Now we have these values posted in our building, they're on our website. We just think these are absolutely crucial. So each week we're walking through one of these different values about how we live this life of Jesus. Um, The last part of the series, these last three weeks of the series, we're looking at uh, this witness of uh, discipleship out into the community. How do we uh, witness of our faith, witness of the good news of Jesus? So last week we looked at evangelism. Today uh, we have this value here where we say that in our church, one of the things that we do is that we serve our community. We serve our community. And of course, Jesus talked about service as a way of life a lot. For instance, Matthew chapter 25, listen to what Jesus says. It says, when the Son of Man, that is Jesus, that's another way of saying Jesus, comes in his glory, And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will come to those on his right and say, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And those on his right will say, What now? What have we done in order to deserve this inheritance? What, why, why would we get this? And Jesus says, well, here's why, verse 25. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, what are you talking about? When, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. I'm going to read that verse again. It's so important. The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they'll go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So no question about it, Jesus takes this lifestyle of of service seriously. Now, if you were just to take this passage out of context and just like lift it off the page, it might sound as if Jesus is saying that that, um, our salvation is is based on our service to people in need. That's kind of what it sounds like Jesus is saying here. Of course, that's not what Christians believe. I mean, Christians 
believe that our salvation comes from God's grace, not our performance. And this is, you know, something all Christians believe. And so if you were to go back and look at this long, long teaching that Jesus has and look at it in context, you would see that what he's lifting up here is he's, he's talking to these Jewish leaders about what the new life looks like in his kingdom, what the new life of, of, of people who belong to the Messiah, how it is that they're going to live. And so, and so in context, Jesus is not being prescriptive in saying this is what you, you need to do in order to be saved. He's being descriptive to say this is a description of how someone's going to live when they, when they belong to the Messiah. This is the new way of life of the kingdom of God is that they're going to live to serve others. Do you remember what James says in James chapter 2? Very similar thing. He says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And so in the same way, James is describing how someone who belongs to the the Messiah is going to live. Their faith is not just going to be what what they think. It's not just going to be what they experience, but rather it's going to be how they how they actually live and put this in place. And one of the ways that we do this, of course, is through service. So a lifestyle of service. This has been part of the Christian witness, the witness of the church uh, from the very beginning. And it's, it's so tied up. Service is so tied up into the Christian life that sometimes I think we forget why. Like sometimes we, we, we don't understand why service is so much a part of the Christian life and we, we lose this big picture. And this is so important to keep in straight, uh, this, this understanding of why it is that we would live a life of service. Because let's be honest, there are all kinds of organizations out there that serve communities. There's all kinds of organizations out there that serve the poor and serve people in need. And so what is it that makes the church different from another organization, such as, I don't know, the United Way or some other group that does really good work? Like, what is it about us that, that, that makes this different? And so, and so we have to understand our why of, of service if we're really going to understand this, this value and why it's important and what we're shooting for. And so, so let's unpack this and let's work on understanding this, this vision for where service comes from and why it's so tied up in the Christian life and what is it that makes us different from any other organization that does good in the world. Like what is it about the Christian witness that is there that, that describes this? And so as we think about our vision for service, this why that is behind our our effort to serve our community. You know, our vision for service, it 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 is not because we're good people. This is what good people do. Our vision for service is, is not because, you know, it's about citizenship and giving back and taking care of because, you know, we belong to this community. That's not our vision for, for, for service. Our vision for service is not even about, not even about compassion. Even though compassion is really important and we certainly believe in compassion, but that's not even what drives this desire and this vision for service for the church. Our vision for why we would serve our community, serve the world is, is bigger than those things. You saw it expressed in what we just read in Matthew chapter 25. The very first thing Jesus says really captures the vision for why we would serve so well. Listen to what Jesus says again. This is um, verse 31, 32, and 33. He says, when the Son of Man comes, when He comes in glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before Him. And He will separate the people from one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. So why would Christians adopt a lifestyle of service? What is the reason for this? Where does our vision come from? Well, it's because the Son of Man, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is coming in glory and he's coming to judge. And I know that speaking of God as judge makes some of us really uncomfortable. But the Christian, um, the biblical vision for judgment is, is, is so much bigger and more beautiful than maybe sometimes we think about, and that's why we get uncomfortable, because we need to understand the, the Christian vision for judgment. You see, the, the Christian, the biblical vision for judgment isn't about punishment. The biblical vision for, for judgment is more about God making things right. It's about God bringing all of creation to conform to his reign 
and his rule. The biblical vision for, for judgment is, is, like, is like God making um, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so there's a, there's a word that we use to describe this, this vision, this, this, this uh, thing that God is going to do, this, this judgment he's going to bring. And, and it's a word we don't use very often, but we probably should use it more often because it is a biblical word. But the biblical word to describe that vision of God making things right is the word justice. Now, we don't use that word very often because that word, I think it gets confused and people, it means different things to different people. Some of us hear the word justice and we think about criminal justice or, or some of us might hear the word justice and we think about it through maybe a, a partisan political lens. We think about things like social justice and what that might mean according to political agendas. But, but the biblical vision here is really about how God is making wrong things right, how God is bringing things in conformity to his will, that the life in the kingdom of God is, is being lived out so that his will is being done. And where God's will is done, do you know what you find? You find salvation. You find deliverance. You find freedom. You find liberation. You find this new kind of life that's only found in the Messiah. You found joy and rejoicing because this is what's happening when, when God's justice is done because God is making things work the way that he has created them to be. And so therefore... Biblical justice is something that we celebrate. It's something that we rejoice in because it's God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, listen to how the Bible describes just this vision of God's justice and how good it is. Here's some examples. Psalm 36, verse 6 says, Your righteousness, the Lord's righteousness, is like the highest mountains. Your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. Like this is part of how you rule the world. Um, Psalm 45, verse 4, in, in your mighty, or sorry, your majesty, ride forth victoriously in the cause of truth. Humility and justice, like would you bring this Lord into this world? Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Psalm 89, verse 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. It's something to celebrate that God is, is bringing this justice. Psalm 101, verse 1. I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord. I will make, I will sing praise. I'm going to rejoice over this and celebrate this. Psalm 103, verse 6. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. And I could go on and on and on with more examples of this because this is such a biblical word. But I think you get it. Like justice is the biblical vision for God's rule and God's reign and God's kingdom being done on earth as it is in heaven. And therefore, this vision of justice, of God's rule and reign, this becomes our vision for service. This becomes what motivates us to serve others, especially in their moments of need. Because when we lift up this vision of God's rule being done, God's will being done, his reign being accomplished, like we also understand that as we look out on the world, there's quite obviously so many things that are outside of God's will. I mean, you don't need to be a theologian with a fancy degree to know that there's so many things that are just absolutely broken and it's just wrong because this is not how God created the world to work. I mean, when you see a child going to bed hungry, you just know this is wrong. When you see people suffering and just being destroyed by addiction, you just know this is wrong. When you see people as the victims of violence, you just, you just know that this is wrong. And so as Christians, we have this vision for service because we understand this is not how God has created the world to be. And, and this is not what he wants. And so, and so this is not how this, this world is going to be when the Son of Man returns in glory. And so we have this vision of what God is going to do to make these wrong things um, right. So what do we do about this? We have this vision of justice. What do we do about this? Because for a Christian to live into the rule and the reign of God, the kingdom of God is not just an idea, it's a whole way of life. A whole way of life when we begin to, to look and to see and to think about these things that are, that are wrong, that God wants to make right. And one of the things that we do here is, is that we serve. We serve in practical ways that start to point people towards something bigger than us. And that's really what service is about. It's a, it's a witness not about our own goodness, but it's a witness about, about God's goodness. It's a witness about God's intentions for people. It's, it's a witness about how God desires that 
that while there may be these things that destroy human flourishing, God's desire is that he wants to restore people. He wants to bless people. He wants to love. He wants people to, to live into the life that they have, that he has for them. And this is, this is life that we see in the kingdom of God. So therefore, this becomes our vision. And in fact, this has been the vision of the church it's from the very beginning, from the time that the Spirit fell at Pentecost. This has been what has driven, driven, driven Christians to, to live a life of service is that there is this witness of something deeper and more beautiful, something about life that can be restored and changed and lived in the kingdom of God. And this is what has separated Christians in society for forever. I mean, in the very, very beginning of the Christian movement as the Christians emerged in the Roman Empire, one of the things that separated Christians from their Roman neighbors was this vision for service, this vision to, to, to change and to, and to lead people into something that was deeper than, than themselves. Because you see, the, the Roman Empire, as the Christian movement emerged, was all about power and, and where you fit within those power dynamics. And then the Christian movement comes along and they start to emphasize things like humility and compassion and generosity and service. And these are not virtues within the Roman Empire. And yet, this is what the Christians are, are living into and this is what they're witnessing to. And, and, and this is like this new kind of life that is available to us, this life in the kingdom of God that shows up in all kinds of practical ways then for these very early Christians. One of my favorite ways that we, we see this in history in the, in the Christian movement is that there was this tradition among Roman families that when a, a, a baby girl was born, if, if the, it was legal and it was acceptable that if you didn't want her, then you could take your, your newborn baby daughter and you could, you could leave her outside the city gates and just walk away. I mean, just imagine that. You could take this newborn, just lay her outside the city gates, turn your back and walk back to your old life. And this was the sole decision of the father of the house because he ruled the house like Caesar ruled the empire. What he wanted to do was what happened. And so people would, would do this because these, these baby girls uh, were, were not valued. Girls and women in the Roman Empire had no value. And so the, the Christians came along and they see this practice and they're like, whoa, this isn't right. Because we know that God has created all of us, male and female in his image. And so therefore all of us are dearly loved and all of us have value. So do you know what the Christians did about this? Well, they didn't have any political power. So what they did was they found these babies who had been exposed. That's what the practice was called. And they'd wrap them up and they'd bring them home and they would adopt them. They, they knew this wasn't wasn't right. And so they began to serve these people who were left like this and they began to do this. This is why whenever I, I come across Christians who stand up for babies or they stand up for, for fostering or adoption, I just think to myself, you stand in this long line of witness of faithful, faithful Christians who have who's had this similar vision of, of serving these people who are in need. And this was this was the witness of the church. This is what drove so much of the growth of the early church that 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 they had this vision for these places that were outside of God's will, that they were going to lead people and serve people and point them to something that was so much deeper. In fact, in the Roman Empire, um, there was this, uh, this emperor named Julian who, who saw the witness of these early Christians and was really concerned about it. And so Julian, this emperor of this Roman Empire, saw the the rise of the Christian movement and became more and more concerned. And, and so he started to put a lot of effort and energy into reviving the old paganism and starting to build temples and paying the priests and trying to bring this about because the paganism was what he believed was, was caused Rome's greatness. And so in great frustration, he saw the Christian movement continue to grow, continue to flourish. And, and so one day he wrote a letter to a pagan priest, a Roman pagan priest, and he was describing in frustration these new Christians that were sharing this witness in the world and the difference it was making. And, and part of this letter has become quite famous. Let me read to you what the Roman emperor Julian wrote about the witness of these early Christians. He says this, he says, quote, nothing has contributed to the progress of the superstition of these Christians as their charity to strangers. The impious Galileans provide not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, the witness that spread the Christian movement, this vision of justice, of God's kingdom, of wrong things being made right and pointing towards something that is bigger and deeper and more beautiful about God's kingdom, like this is what drove, that drove these, these early Christians. And this vision is what drives us. And but you know what? This vision can also overwhelm us. I mean, we, we live in a, in a culture today that just drowns us in information. I mean, 
The news is at our fingertips. Social media is bringing stuff to us all the time. And you're gonna find out all the kinds of things that are wrong in the world just at your fingertips, almost in real time as you come across all these kinds of things. And, and if there's something wrong in the world, something going on in the world, it's like you, you know about it so quickly. And it's very quickly becomes this kind of thing where you start to drown in all of this information that's out there about all of the things that we need to do, about all of the things that are broken. And it's just like you're drinking from a fire hose of information at times. And I've, I've noticed that sometimes for Christians, we, um, we start to have so much information coming at to us that we, we begin to not talk about people, but we begin to talk about issues. And so we, we start talking about violence. We start talking about poverty. And it becomes this, these words, like we start using words like disproportionate as disproportionate groups are suffering from this. Or we start talking about systemic issues. And, and again, it's like, I get that these things are broken and wrong, but I don't know what to do about it. Like I start to drown in all of the things that are, that are happening around me. But when I read what Jesus said, when he talks about visiting the hung, or feeding the hungry and clothing those who don't have clothes and, and, and visiting those who are sick or in prison. You know what? I, I don't hear Jesus talking about our, our issues. I, I hear Jesus talking about people. And there's this part of this vision that's so, that's so important here is that, is that as we think about our act of service, it is easy to get lost in issues. But when Jesus calls to us, what we really need to be reminded of and pulled back to are, are the people that are right in front of us. This reminds me of that really famous story Jesus told in Luke chapter 10. This is probably the most famous story Jesus told. You don't need to be a Christian to know this story. It's so famous, but in Luke 10, Jesus tells the story about a man who's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And on this road, which is a famously violent road, this man was, was robbed, beaten up, and left for dead. And as Jesus tells the story, a, a, a priest comes by and sees the man and passes by on the other side. And so too, a Levite comes by and sees the man and passes by on the other side. But then finally, a Samaritan, or in other words, an enemy comes by and he sees this man, he has pity on him. He picks the man up and he bandages his wounds, put him on his own donkey and carries him to an inn where he pays the innkeeper to take care of him. And this is, you know, the famous story of the, of the good Samaritan. And it's one of the stories we, we all know. It's an inspiring story about doing good and loving your neighbors and serving others and I learned this story as a kid in Sunday school, and you don't need to be a Christian to know it. It's just, it's just so, so famous. But as well, I've learned this as a, as a little kid, in my own thinking, some things have shifted in how I understand that story in the last couple of years. One of the things that shifted in my own thinking was I, I started to look at what this Good Samaritan does in this story. And I noticed that the Good Samaritan doesn't do everything. He simply does what he can. Um, if you notice, the Good Samaritan, while he picks the man up and he takes him to the inn, he doesn't stay at the inn. He pays for the work to be done and then he goes on his way. Like he does what he can. But then what I really noticed though was that when the Good Samaritan is, is dealing with this, this person, um, he specifically does that. He deals with the person. He doesn't go on a campaign to try to eradicate the systemic violence that's uh, suffering on the road to Jerusalem and Jericho, however important that might be. He doesn't you know, start a petition to the Roman government to try to change things. He doesn't post on Facebook about all the things that are going on there. He just simply sees this need that's right in front of him and he responds. Like sometimes we, we drown in this information and, and we make uh, everything about issues or, or things like that. And we, we lose sight sometimes of the people that's right in front of us, but a, a lifestyle of service, this Christian witness, it's, it's lived out with real real people. So in our church, we take this um, value of service seriously, very, very seriously. It's so serious that in fact, we started a whole organization for us to reach out into our community called Flourish. And the idea of this, of this work is that we want to find ways and deeper ways of caring for people who are in need and in the ways that we can. But as we think about our approach to this, you know, as you get to know our church, our approach to this uh, value might be a little bit different than you might experience in some other places. For one, this insight about the, the importance of the individual is incredibly important to us. We see people who are in need and that's where we want to respond is with the individuals who are right in front of us. So we're not a church that gets really big rallies around issues or, or political causes. We, we really want to really focus on on the people that are there and how it is that we can care for them and serve them and, and empower people to make different decisions and different paths in life that they might find a, a new way of living that's according to what God wants to do for them. 
And this is really what, what drives us as we see this, this vision, not just about, you know, let's try to help people, let's be good people, but really we see this vision to say, you know what, the Lord wants to restore people. The Lord wants to bring his will on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord wants to bring salvation and deliverance and forgiveness and healing to people. And this is what the Lord wants to do. And we get to be part of it because we have this vision that the Son of Man is going to return and he's going to judge the world. But, but as we get to be part of this, as, as things that are made ro- that are wrong are made right, we get to be part of what the Lord is doing. And, and in the meantime, while we wait for the Son of Man to come in glory, we get to be this witness of God's goodness that's lived out in our acts of service. Because we're not witnessing to ourselves, we're witnessing to the goodness of God, the intentions of God to bring healing and forgiveness and joy and salvation and deliverance to real people that are right in front of us. Let's live that kind of vision out. And we're gonna see this incredible witness about what God can do in real people's lives. Let's pray. And so Father, today we, um, we, we see this vision that you have of restoration, salvation, of justice. And uh, we, we wanna pray for this over our, over our lives, over our families, over our church, over our community. And the truth is there are gonna be people every single day that are, that are given in front of us and we have these choices of how we're going to respond to them. Are we gonna serve or are we gonna be selfish? Are we gonna serve or are we gonna seek to be served? Are we gonna put ourselves first? We're gonna put ourselves last. And Lord, may we be the kinds of people who live a witness not of our own goodness, but of your goodness, of of you reaching out into the world to seek and to save those that are lost. And so may you use our acts of service. May you use our willingness to, to serve others in a way that brings glory and honor to you and even brings people to knowing you. And we live like this because this is what you have done for us. The Son of Man did not come to, to be served, but to serve. And so Lord, we wanna live in the model of Jesus. The model of Jesus who served us so much that he went to the cross for us. And so we pray today, Lord, this this great um, understanding of what you have done for us. May we live in the same way, with the same values, seeking to serve others as a witness of the goodness of God in the world. It's in the name of Jesus we pray today. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us in worship today. Hope you've had a great weekend, a great Uh, time with other people and celebrating uh, women in your life who've made profound and significant contributions to you, to who you are, and who've shared the faith of God with you. Uh, Big thanks to the folks who helped produce worship today, to Alec who's behind the scenes, to Stephanie and to to the worship team, to Spencer for that encouraging message about how we serve, why we serve, and and how we look for the the justice that God wants to bring, the setting all things right in this world that God wants to bring to each and every one of us and how we we long for that and how we can be a part of that, actively carrying that out each and every day. Hope you were encouraged and we would be, be thankful if you would share this with people around you who need to hear this. And we would also be grateful if you took a moment and if you liked and, and uh, thumbs up this on your thumbs up or button there, and then share this with folks. That'd be awesome. Look forward to seeing you next week where, where we'll have week six of the Come Follow Me series. Have a great day. So the whole wide
the whole world.